Tom Honeyman revolutionised Glasgow's attitude to its own art treasures and enhanced the overall collection through his acquisition of key works of the French Impressionists and Scottish colourists. His growing reputation impressed Sir William Burrell, a wealthy shipowner and private art collector. The two men got on well, and in a secret cloak and dagger style meeting with Honeyman one winter evening, Sir William revealed his intention of donating his priceless collection to the city. For once in his life he was speechless when Sir William told him to go and take a train and go to Hutton Castle and be told the news that the collection was going to Glasgow. And uh, that really was the thrill of a lifetime. He could hardly believe it. William Burrell had made his fortune from shipping and spent a lifetime collecting religious antiquities, tapestries, as well as a staggeringly varied collection of paintings. When it was given to Glasgow in 1943, the collection contained over 8,000 items. The destination of Burrell's treasures had also been the subject of a lot of speculation. He had many other offers, a lot of offers from London at that time, but he decided that the city in which he had made his money was the place where he would like to put it. And of course Tom Honeyman was the man to whom he was close. He was confident that Tom Honeyman would look after his collection well. And it came to Glasgow because of Tom Honeyman. Absolutely no doubt about that. Securing Burrell's treasures and adding significantly to the Glasgow collection were fine achievements for any man. But Honeyman hadn't yet conducted the deal that would place him in the city at the centre of world art. While in London in 1951, Tom Honeyman visited an exhibition of Salvador Dali's recent work that was drawing tremendous crowds. One painting in particular, Christ of St John of the Cross, stood out. It was a nice story because Tom was down in London. I call him Tom, I mean, I never knew him, but I, somehow one, one immediately becomes very familiar with him. But Dr Honeyman was down in London and uh, he went to this gallery and there were all these people crowded around the painting. And there were some nice drawings. The painting was 12,000, 12 grand. You know, that, was, that could build a few houses, quite a few houses in those days. People all crowded around this painting. It's causing a great deal of interest. So he rang up his convener and said, there's some nice drawings, you see. And his convener said, well, why don't we go for the painting? You know? why, why are we going for the drawing, you see? The drawing was 250 quid. And, and Honeyman said, well, we can't go for the painting. It's 12 grand, you see. We'll get something off it, he said. In 1951, when the negotiations started, the Dali was talking about 12,000. The price came down to 8,200. It was still a huge amount of money, and there were people who would have been reasonably comfortable had the painting been something else, rather more, which they could understand. He uh, was very impressed with it. Then he suddenly thought, am I being fooled, you know? <laughs> and he stepped back, he writes about it. He said, am I, oh, you know, am I being conned here, you know? Is it really as good as I think it is, you see? And Glasgow bought it, you know, straight from the easel virtually, the first time it had ever been exhibited, you know. A huge buzz was created about the purchase of the painting, the press were calling Le Christ. Alert as ever, Honeyman capitalised on the huge interest from the public to see Glasgow's controversial buy. Tom Honeyman arranged that when people came to see it, they paid. And within a very short time, Within something like three months, they collected £2,000 of the 8200 and it showed in a very short period of time just how successful the painting was going to be, not only in aesthetic terms, but in financial terms. Uh, it was only when I came in that I realised what an amazing purchase it was, because purchasing contemporary art, uh, you know, right at the moment it was being painted, you know, and it was an immediate response, and not a cheap purchase. That was a lot of money. Darnley was one of the most famous artists of his time. It's quite an impressive painting, you know, especially when you're young and you, you see it, and it's just got that wow factor about it, because the surface is almost like glass. I suppose it's quite a cinematic looking painting. It's quite a striking image, just got that kind of impact straight away. There's also this weird, such strange feeling of space in the painting. I always thought it was a you know, a painting that was two or three hundred years old and I didn't realise it's, you know, it was a 20th century painting. Even amongst artists that don't particularly like it and who have grown up here, I think people remember it. I think the wonderful thing about this painting is that it illustrates the way that a painting has a life of its own. It's the sense that it belongs to the city of Glasgow, that it's immensely popular, that it's very much bound up in, in the history of the city. It has its own momentum, which has nothing to do with what the artist was trying to do when he painted it. 
Daly painted Christ as St John of the Cross after seismic shifts in his life. Following an audience with the Pope in 1947, Daly rediscovered his Catholic faith, which became the central theme of his work. Despite his celebrity and his widely varying subject matter, Daly remained true to his Spanish roots. His attachment to the coastline of his childhood was a constant source of inspiration. In particular, the view from his studio in Port Leggette, which featured heavily in his paintings of the 1950s. It's hard to imagine most of Salvador Dali's work without remembering it was inspired by Port Ligat. It was a place of intense inspiration and love for Dali. Nearly all his paintings depict some part of Port Ligat or feature the light around the Cap de Creus. Dali's religious paintings were well received by the public, but critics were not impressed, accusing him of selling out artistically in the pursuit of money. In a time when abstract art was dominant, his return to a figurative style also came under attack. However, for Dali, religious content was a way of communicating with as wide an audience as possible. The public immediately understand religious paintings. So when Dali paints religious subject matter, he's working to a formula that people can immediately relate to. You could say it's the same thing he was trying to do when he was making films in Hollywood in the 1950s. Dali had a vision. He was a visionary. There was also a drawing by the Carmelite monk and mystic poet, St. John of the Cross, held in a convent in Avila. When Dali found out about this drawing, he was excited, and it inspired him to begin this magical work. It took Dali four months to complete the painting. He used Hollywood's top stuntman, Russ Saunders, as his model for Jesus, and was assisted in the complex geometrical composition by a local architect, Emilio Puichnell. On its completion, Dali considered the work to be his masterpiece, content that it would take pride of place in Kelvin Grove Art Galleries. I remember Dali's pleasure that the painting was going to a great international collection like Glasgow. He was very happy about his painting being in Glasgow. Given the unprecedented international profile Dali enjoyed, Glasgow's acquisition was remarkable. However, in a time better remembered for post-war austerity and industrial decline, at £8,200, it was also quite shocking. Reactions to the purchase were mixed and at times extreme. I think he did expect quite a lot of opposition to it, but uh, he was... He was really very keen on it. He, he did think about it a great deal before he went, went ahead with it. He knew that there would be reaction, but he didn't expect quite so much venom in the reaction and personal. One of the strongest sources of opposition to the purchase was Glasgow School of Art. Not only did the students feel that the money should be spent on Scottish art, but also that the purchase was a bad piece of business. In the spirit of 50s radicalism, William Crozier organised a petition expressing the students' grievances. I thought the price they paid was far in excess you know, of what you could buy a dali at. I'd been in Paris for quite some time, and I saw how exhibitions could be done and how great museums could be made, you know, and they wouldn't have bought junk like this. I mean, if you look at this painting, you would never imagine that this man would ever say, today you'll be with me in paradise. You know, he would be saying, you know, today I will be in Hollywood. He had to stick by his own convictions and his job as director. He felt this was something very valuable for Glasgow's future. It just seems to have created a sensation when it came to the city, and repeated viewings seem to have kind of enriched it. It has a power of its own. 